perfect. So yeah, if you have your uh, Bible with you, I invite you to uh, open it at uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, or you can uh, follow through on the screen. I will uh, read from uh, verse 1. Um, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a, ro with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to a place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to swept her away with the flood. But the earth came to help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offsprings, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Amen. Thank you, Felix. Uh, let's bow down our uh, heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, beautiful Sunday. We thank you for your church gathered here in this place. And uh, we ask that you would uh, teach us from your word. We want to receive everything that uh, your word has for us. All the teachings that we find in it, we know that uh, they are uh, precious to us and useful to guide our lives and our steps so that we, we, we might live a holy life. Thank you again for everything, and we praise your name forever and ever. Amen. Well, how about that for a text? Uh, it feels like uh, Pastor Conrad said last time, it, it feels more like a movie uh, scene or a movie plot than, uh, um, I guess, what most people think when they think about uh, the Word of God. Um, Every time when I'm uh, leading worship, uh, uh, I somehow feel feel much more comfortable 
there than here. <laughs> and I and I guess Pastor, Pastor Eric understands me better here because he oftentimes switches and leads worship and then preaches, but um, um, it's different. It's much different uh, than, uh, than singing. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. So uh, let's uh, let's get into the word of God. OK, so we're accustomed by now that uh, scripture interprets scripture and the book of Revelation makes it abundantly clear because without the knowledge of the Old Testament, we would be hard pressed to find a coherent explanation for all the symbolism that we find in this book. The Roman Catholic Church would say that the woman clothed with the sun in verse 1 is the Virgin Mary. And when we read this at first glance, we might think that also. Uh, others say that she represents the church. And others say that she represents Israel. If we read the text carefully, we see that the woman is a sign. And a sign is usually a representation of something. So naturally, you would conclude that the text is not literally talking about a pregnant woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, but about something metaphorical and pointing us in a direction representative of that. More so if we assume that the author of the book of Revelation is John, like we did at the beginning of this series, we know that he walked with Jesus for three and a half years and that he knew his family including his mother Mary, whom Jesus himself entrusted into the apostles' care at his crucifixion. So why would he refer to a woman that he personally knew and cared for after Jesus' resurrection as a sign? Now, if we access our Old Testament knowledge, and I hope we're ready, we remember that in the book of Genesis, in chapter 37, verses 7 through 10, Joseph had a dream involving some of the same imagery. Let's read the text. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you. And now, if you'll allow me to quote uh, the overview notes that Pastor Conrad prepared for this series. And they say, and I quote, indicating the woman is clothed with the patriarchal character and covenantal promises of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons. Close quote. And there you have it. We have the sun representing Jacob, the moon representing Joseph's mother Rachel, and the 11 stars representing the sons of Jacob, of Jacob, whose name was later changed by God to Israel and whose sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. The chosen people of God, Israel, are represented many times in the Old Testament as a woman. And we can clearly see that in, for example, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 20. Surely, as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. We can see this again in Isaiah 54, in Ezekiel 16, and I just want to read another one from Hosea, uh, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. And we know that the whole point of the book of Hosea was that the prophet would marry an adulterous woman so that God could show them what the, his relationship with the people of Israel is. And I'll just uh, read verses 19 and 20 from Hosea chapter 2. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. 
The pregnancy, the birth pains, and the agony of giving birth all indicate that the Messiah will be born from Israel and all the trials Israel faced before the birth of Christ. Now, when it comes to the dragon, we can see that at first it's also called a sign, which most likely represents a nature, a character, a character full of evil, the embodiment of evil, but not a literal dragon. The seven heads, the diadems, and the horse, horns are paralleled by some with a symbolically revived Roman Empire, most likely based on the prophetic writings of Daniel chapter 7. This is mixed with a reference to the true dragon, who will, we will later see our text closes in on, beyond the sign and the metaphor, and more specifically identifies as, as Satan. Moving on to the ending of verse 4, the attempt to stop the work of the child, to devour him as soon as he was born, seems to be initially fulfilled by Herod's attempt to kill Jesus as a child. We can read about that in Matthew chapter 2. But it can also be seen throughout the life of Christ, as Satan attacked him trying to derail and thwart the sovereign plan of God. The rest of our scripture passage for today starts to further clarify things for us. As again, we can clearly see the child, is, the child born is undoubtedly Jesus, who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And it cements our interpretation that the woman represents Israel, as we have no biblically grounded reason to think that the woman fleeing into the wilderness is Mary. It is very likely that verses 5 and 6 present a past and future sequence of events. As they relate to us, the child caught up to God is a reference to the ascension of Jesus. The fleeing of the woman into the wilderness is referencing events that some have occurred and some are yet to occur until the end of time. If we are to correlate them with the prophecy, for example, from Daniel chapter 9. Time is often warped in prophetic writings and things blend from past to present and future. As all these writings are in many ways timeless, but also time bound. The next two verses, verses 7 and 8, describe the war in heaven between the angelic uh, beings ruled by the archangel um, Michael on the one hand and the dragon or Satan and his angels. The heavenly, the heavenly battle is evidence again of the great spiritual war that is taking place on earth, but not only on earth, but also in heaven. And the dragon, who not only fights us, fights against us, but also against a heavenly ruler like Michael, the archangel, who is the commander of the heavenly hosts. The victor of this battle we can see in our text is Michael, and Satan is banned from accessing heaven. All things considered, this could be interpreted in multiple ways. One, it could represent the angelic fall at the beginning of creation, a heavenly battle in the middle of the tribulation, or the victory of Christ over Satan in the gospel. Now, we know from Pastor Conrad's sermon last Sunday that uh, the tribulation is not necessarily, as he put it, a period of time at the end of time itself. But it appears that we might be in the tribulation even now, or that the tribulation, it's repeating itself multiple times over history until the end of time. I would lean towards the second interpretation. It seems that the victory of Christ over Satan in the gospel and Satan's war against God's people imagery are presented separately in verses 10 and 11. Satan and his angels lost the battle, he's prevented from accessing heaven, and as a consequence of his defeat, and because of this, he appears to focus all his rage against the inhabitants of earth. 
verse 12 seems to jump ahead to the conclusion of our entire scripture passage for today. We see that heaven rejoices because the dragon is cast out, but at the same time we see the warning for the inhabitants of earth. For now Satan focuses all his wrath on them. More specifically, he appears to be focused against the chosen nation of God, the people of Israel, but also on the Gentiles who have been grafted into the chosen people of God, meaning all those who believe in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is where we, where we will focus the rest of our attention for today. The war that the devil is waging against the believer. The true world war. We know that a war is being waged against believers, a spiritual war, and it's spearheaded uh, by a raging enemy. Scripture also describes him like a lion in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. It says, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How should we as believers defend ourselves against the enemy? Well, thankfully, we have a very detailed description of our weapons of spiritual warfare in uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. I know it's a longer passage, but, but uh, uh, let's, uh, let's follow together. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in, heaven, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done, done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To the end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, did you notice that this description is primarily of defensive attire? That whole section from the book of Ephesians is entitled the armor of God. We have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes for our feet, the readiness given by the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and in the end, we have one weapon that we can use for our offensive against the enemy, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If we turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we find the example of Jesus Christ himself fighting against the devil. And I want us to read the passage, and I also want you to pay attention at how Jesus fights Satan. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him uh, stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, and throw yourself down, yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered to him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, 
if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. We can see how our Lord Jesus used the sword, the word of scripture against the devil to defeat his schemes and his attacks. It is written, is our only weapon against the enemy. This is why we must know the word of God. We have to read it. We have to memorize it. We have to study it. We must be ready to fight at all times. The rest of our protection against the evil one comes from something that was already done for us. We find written in verse 11 of our text for today that the enemy is overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and by the fact that believers did not love their life to the death. Let's look at what the blood of the lamb uh, signifies. The sacrifice of Christ on Calvary is what gives the assurance of ultimate victory to believers. The protective armor against the evil dragon is provided in its entirety by God. The belt of truth comes from Jesus, who is truth himself. The breastplate of righteousness comes from Jesus, whose righteousness was imputed to us and in whose sacrifice we are justified. Our feet are protected by the readiness given by the gospel of peace, peace between, me, uh, between man and God. Good news with Jesus as, as the center of it all once again. The shield of faith, saving faith in Jesus, faith which is given to us by God himself. And at last, the helmet of salvation, salvation accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. Nothing that we use in this fight against the dragon of old is of our own making, neither the, neither the armor or the sword, but both were forged in the purif purifying fires of the Holy Council of the Triune God, and nothing, I repeat, nothing can stand against the workmanship of God. What he offers for our use in our defensive and in our offensive strategy is 100% the only reason why we can face the enemy. Without this, our chances for victory would be entirely non-existent. What about the second thing that we, have, we found written in, in verse 11? What about the word of our testimony? This would be the knowledge and the remembrance of the work of God in our lives. This is our only testimony that holds any power. We, we remember who we were and we know who we are now after God has revealed himself to us a changed life and the knowledge that it was God who made it all possible is what keeps Satan's lies at bay. The accuser, the slanderer will fail while using one of his main weapons against us. If we are faithful witnesses to the testimony that we bear of this glorious work done in our lives. And at last, the third thing uh, we found written in verse 11, they did not love their lives to the death. What happens when we focus on our wants, on our desires, our hopes, our dreams, our dislikes, our comfort, our preferences all the time? Might I, might I suggest that when we do this, we become more and more like the dragon. We become more beastly in our nature and the image of God in us is gradually extinguished. We know that pride Filled, uh, filled Lucifer's heart and he became the serpent of old, the dragon, the beast and the embodiment of evil itself. Pride was what serves as a basis for all of our sins. Because of our pride, we cannot focus on anything else other than our own life. And this is what the beginning and the end for, what, for every man and woman is. Because he was proud King Nebuchadnezzar was severely punished. And whether we think his punishment is literal or figurative, it is unde undeniable the message it conveys to us. And let's read the passage that speaks about this from Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 through 37. 
All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know that a Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives, gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers, and his nails were like birds' claws. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will amongst the hosts of heaven and among, amongst the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stand his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. In closing, I want to suggest to you that the moment when we realized there, realized there is more to life than ourselves and that the King of Heaven is the only one worthy of all praise and glory, that's the moment when we stop worshipping ourselves, when our eyes are open to the truth. It is the moment when we come, when we are made alive and human again. This is when the light of the image of God begins to shine most brightly in us and the attack of the devil is defeated. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that everything that we need to fight off the attacks of the evil one has already been provided in the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation that we have in his sacrifice. We thank you for our new birth, for our new life, that we can be sure of our holiness that was bought on the cross, the righteousness that was imputed to us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you that now, we don't have to listen to the accusations of the enemy. We thank you that we know who you are in Jesus Christ and that nothing can take us away from your hand. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.